Five Stone. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we are so glad that you are here. If this is your first time visiting us today, please go to fivestonechurch.com slash welcome so that we can connect with you and help you take your next steps in your relationship with Jesus. Our goal at Five Stone is to provide opportunities for you to connect with God and others, grow to be more like Jesus, and go in service locally and globally. Here are a few ways for you to connect, grow, and go. Hi, I'm Pastor Steve and one of the pastors here at Five Stone, and I wanted to take this opportunity to invite you to discover Five Stone. If you've been around a while and you'd like to know more about the church and you're thinking about placing membership, this would be a great opportunity for you to learn more. We'll serve you lunch, we'll take care of your kiddos, and you'll get to learn more about the mission and vision of Five Stone. And it'll give us the opportunity to get to know you as well. You can sign up one of two ways, either on the church app, or you can go to fivestonechurch.com slash events and register there. We hope to see you there. Women of Five Stone, we want to invite you to our first ever fall flannel. We all know that friends matter, but what is friendship according to Christ? Join us as we welcome our guest speaker, Kelly Needham, as she points out our world's constricted views of friendship and shows us life-giving biblical views of Christ-centered friendship. Invite your BFF, throw on your favorite flannel, and join us Saturday, November 6th from 7 to 9 p.m. Today, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper during a portion of our worship. If you are joining us online, feel free to gather your elements now. You can grab items such as juice, crackers, bread, or whatever you have available. The Lord's Supper is a time when we as Christians can reflect on Jesus' sacrificial love for us and express our love back to Him. More explanation of what the Lord's Supper is will be given later in the service. If you'd like to know more information about the things coming up at Five Stone, visit our website or check out the app. With all that said, it's time to get started. Welcome to Five Stone. Good morning, everyone. Man, let's worship the Lord this morning. Let's all stand to our feet. We're going to teach you a new one this morning that Jesus' love changes everything. Let's sing this out together this morning. I see his body breaking. I see his fingers bleeding. See the darkness tremble at the ground below his feet. And in the darkest hour, there are Calvary. He was sweetly broken, broken.
sin's foolishness into this broken world. It is this hope we found. We found you, Christ. It is the Son of God and on a cross blood stain and came and gave his life, his life for us. Sing it out, church. put our hands together for the God of grace this morning. Amen. God is so good. He is a God of grace and he loves us so much. We're so thankful that you are worshiping here at Five Stone with us. You may take a seat. We want to welcome those who are worshiping online as well. Thank you so much. We're going to this morning participate in the Lord's Supper and our host team should have um, offered you one of the little juice cups and wafers. If for some reason uh, you were missed and you would like to participate this morning in the Lord's Supper, just raise your hand wherever you are and the host team will be glad. We have some down here at the front. And so thank you. 
they'll get to you and, and serve you. As we uh, prepare our hearts to partake in the Lord's Supper, I, I want to just draw your, your thoughts to two things this morning. As the Lord calls us to do this, the Bible says that as often as we do this, we're to do it in remembrance of me. Those words from Jesus said that this is a time for us to gather as the body of Christ. Those of us who have a relationship with the Lord, those who know him, and to remember what he has done for us. The sacrifice that he made, the willingness that he had to go to the cross and to become the sin sacrifice in our place. What an incredible thought this morning, and it's important that we remember what he has done. So often in our busy, hurried world, we can forget. And so Jesus calls us to remember. The Bible also says that when we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so today, as we take of these elements, the symbolic wafer, the bread that represents his body, broken and given for us on the cross, and as we drink the cup, which symbolically reminds us of the blood that was shed for us, we're proclaiming a death. But it wasn't just any death. It was the death of Jesus Christ, a death like none other. You see, Jesus was doing something that no one else could do. It was the fact that Jesus, who was the sinless Son of God, took on sin for us. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible says in Acts 4.12 that there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. You see, I believe what we're proclaiming this morning when we remember what Jesus has done for us is not just simply a death and the sacrifice, but a very exclusive death and sacrifice. Our gospel has an exclusivity about it. There is no other way that you and I could be brought back into a righteous relationship with the holy God other than the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. And so today we're remembering and we're proclaiming something that has significance and weight. And we're also reminded that the Bible says that Jesus is coming again. You see, we do not worship this morning a dead Savior, but we worship a risen Lord Savior this morning. Amen? He is alive. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. And one of these days, he's going to return to this earth, this earth that is groaning, waiting for the day of redemption, and he's coming back. He's going to come back as King of kings and Lord of lords, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But you see, today we have an opportunity to confess that he is our Lord. As we take this bread, let's be reminded of what he's done for us. As we drink this cup, let's be reminded that without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission, no forgiveness of sin. And let's thank the Lord that we have a Savior who loves us enough to die for us. What a great and wonderful thought this morning. In just a moment, our worship team is going to continue to lead us in worship. And I would ask you to not feel rushed to take the elements. 
but to do what the Bible says, that we should examine ourselves, we should consider what we're doing before we take of the bread and drink of the cup. If there's any sin, any known sin that the Holy Spirit brings to our heart and mind as we contemplate what God is doing in our life, we can remember that if we'll confess that sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so you'll have time during this next worship song to take of the Lord's Supper. A time to remember, a time to proclaim, and a time to give thanks that Jesus is coming again. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that we as your body, we as your followers can celebrate the Lord's Supper. We can observe and be obedient to what you have commanded us to do today to remember you as we take this wafer, as we drink of this cup. I pray, Father, that we would be reminded that were it not for the sacrificial death of Jesus, we would have no relationship with you. We thank you that you love us that much to draw us back to you through your love and through your grace. Thank you, Jesus, that you're coming again. So we rejoice today that we have relationship with the living God who loves us, who cares for us, and who provides for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you continue to take the Lord's Supper this morning, we just want to sing about God's goodness. Let's just sing that chorus again. Let's just worship Him this morning. This is the God of grace, how glorious. This is the God of grace, how marvelous, found in His favor, fullness forever. This is the God of grace, how glorious. This is the God of how glorious this is the god of grace how marvelous found in his favor fullness forever this is the god of grace how
good to us. Thank you so much. You may be seated. If you're our guest here at Five Stone, whether you are here in the room or worshiping with us online, we want to extend a very special welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we would love to be able to share with you more about our ministry and connect with you, get to know you and and try to uh, be a blessing to you. And if you're online, we just ask that you email info at fivestonechurch.com and let us know that you've joined us today and we'll connect with you. If you're here in the room, there's a card in the seat back in front of you. It's called a communication card. And we'd ask that you would fill that out. You can bring it out to the lobby to one of us pastors afterward or drop it in one of the offering receptacles before you leave. And, and we'll reach out to you. We won't bother you, but we will uh, try to just uh, let you know about the ministry of Five Stone and what all God is doing here and the vision that God has given us for this area and also to reach the globe as well. So we're so thankful uh, that you came this morning. You know, part of what God is doing is is ministering not only to our church family, but around the world as well. And when we have opportunity, we want to be sure that you know of uh, what's going on with our church family, especially when there is something significant that that we feel like you can be a part of and you need to be praying and, uh, and joining in in supporting one of our church family members. We have a young family, the Furmans, Francisco and Kayla, and their uh, young son, Ethan. They're going through a, a very difficult season right now, and some of you know their story, but some of you may not know their story. And so we thought we would share that with you and then let you know how you can pray for them and also support them in a very tangible way. So if you would, uh, take a look at the screens. On September 1st, we thought, you know, we might have to be planning a funeral instead of getting a nursery ready, so. Whenever she call me, like, like, it's, it's, it's just tough because, you know, like as a man, like we should, we should try to do everything. Like, you know, I can, I can do nothing other than just hold her hand. You know, it's for a reason the Lord has put you here for a reason and everything's in the Lord's hands and we just gotta be faithful. I guess you kinda always go into pregnancy thinking that something could happen, but you never really expect that to happen to you. Um, then, especially since everything was so easy with Ethan the first time around, so um, then last year I had a miscarriage and that was really hard for all three of us. And so when we found out we were pregnant again, we were really excited, and Ethan was really excited. Um, and you, you get through every appointment kind of in the back of your mind wondering, like, is it going to be okay? Is it going to be okay? And then with each ultrasound, everything looks good. Um, then we got to our 20-week anatomy scan and found out there was um, no amniotic fluid and he was missing his kidneys. So she sent me to a specialist. and. He confirmed they had bilateral renal agenesis, which is no kidneys and um, low mass of antioxidant fluid. And historically, it's 100% lethal, um, not necessarily just because of the kidneys, but because of the lack of fluid um, not allowing the lungs to develop. So um, they basically told us we had one to two weeks and expect him to pass away uh, in utero and didn't really leave us with any options because 
Uh, typically, your options are termination or just carry the pregnancy as far as you can and then expect to have a stillborn birth. So we found um, Johns Hopkins has a, a research trial basically for um, for situations kind of like ours where either there's partial kidney failure or complete kidney failure. The reality is we're going to be in a situation where our child is on dialysis for two years and needs a kidney transplant. So, um, so right now Every four days, we're going down to Houston to get amnium infusions um, so that his lungs can continue to develop. And he's actually doing really well. In the next three weeks or so, we have to plan to be in Houston full time uh, in case I have to be on bed rest in the hospital. Financial support is our biggest need right now. We don't, it's hard to say what our needs are because we don't really know. <laughs> Every day is kind of different, and um, we just kind of have to focus on it one day at a time. Literally, it's going to take everyone we know just supporting us and being on our, our side to get through this because we don't even know how big of a deal this is and what we're about to get into. But Five Sun's been really encouraging. Um, so it's been really helpful to have just a community of people that come around you and care for you and take care of you and send you cards and let you know that they're, they're thinking about you and they're praying for you. You know, just to relieve a prayer, that, that relief the prayer has on you and that you know that God is with you and then also you have like a people that that's there you know to spiritually support you and then you know you're not alone and the extra care that people have been checking on Ethan and making sure that he's doing good too because he's in this as well that's meant a lot to us people praying scripture over you and just praying yeah. truth over you um, just kind of defeating the lies of the enemy because it's easy to let fear and doubt creep in yeah. in a situation like this but uh, for people constantly just like refocusing your mind on you know what's true is has been really encouraging and helpful I think for both of us and that's yeah. really been a huge blessing to know that um, it's just been like a huge encouragement to know that people are there for you yeah. when you need them join me on stage and can you just express your love and your appreciation to them for sharing their story with us? And it's so much more than just a story. It's, it's what you're walking through right now. And, you know, I've said this many times at Five Stone that our heart is that no one would walk alone. And Francisco and Kayla and Ethan have been part of our church family for a a good number of years and we're just so thankful that we can do what the Bible tells us to do in Romans to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice and Francisco and Kayla we're just committed to support you and to try to encourage you and to be a blessing to you and we're thankful that you found uh, this uh, research thing in, in Houston, an opportunity in Houston, but that means that that uh, they're likely to be going down, what, in just a couple of weeks maybe, and you're going to be there. And so we may not see them physically here at the church, but we need to continue uh, to support them and encourage them and pray for them. And I just felt like as a, as a church family, they're facing a lot of unknowns and a very real tangible unknown is just the, the financial burden that is ahead of them. And so I just feel like Five Stone can not only pray for them, but we as a church family, if the Lord would lay it on our hearts to support them and be a blessing to them. So today I wanna encourage you, if the Lord's leading you, you pray about that and ask God how you might can be a blessing to Francisco and Kayla and Ethan in a very tangible, real way through a financial gift. And there's easy ways for you to give. Uh, they're on the screen. You can see those. You can give through our app. You can give through our website. You can text uh, their name and the amount you would like to give uh, to 84321. And then those who are here with us today, of course, you can use the offering envelope that's in front of you in the seat back and just write their name on the offering envelope. And that money will go to help them with uh, their journey ahead. And we're just committed 
uh, to walk with you and we're praying with you for Wesley for a miracle and for God just to continue to work in your lives. You have exhibited incredible faith and strength and it's just been um, you know something that that we want to try to walk with you through. So we love you guys and and uh, Five Stone wants to be here for you. Can can you just express your love again one one time to them? So I encourage you to give, but another thing we're going to do today, uh, Francisco and Kayla are going to go down to the front now, and I want to invite those who are willing to come and to pray over them and lay hands on them. So let's all stand right now as we're going to enter into a time of prayer. And those who feel led, you, you just make your way to the front here. And Francisco and Kayla are going to come. And we're going to have a prayer time over them and praying for Wesley, their child, and asking God to do what only God can do. We know that God is a big God. He's a good God. And Francisco and Kayla are trusting him in this moment, and, and we are as a church family as well. Just reach your hand out to the person in front of you if you're comfortable lifting your hands toward Francisco and Kayla in this moment. Let's go and pray over them. Heavenly Father, we come in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. And we come on behalf of Francisco and Kayla praying for Wesley and joining them, God, in their cry to you that you would do a miracle in Wesley's body, that you would heal his body, that you are the God of miracles. You are the God who can do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or imagine. You're the God who is able. There is nothing that is too difficult for you, Father. And so as we confess that and as we believe that with our hearts and we're collectively asking for that, we also bow humbly before you as the sovereign God, knowing that your will is perfect and good. And we pray, God, that your will would be done. And we thank, we're so thankful for this program that they're able to enter into in Houston. And as they go down there, God, would, would you take care of every detail? Would you provide for them financially, provide for them places to stay, food to eat, and, and just cover them, Lord? We ask, God, that this medical intervention might be what you want to do, Father. We would pray that that this would be the answer for Wesley. If, if God, there is not divine healing we pray that you would work. We ask for you to continue to help Francisco and Kayla keep their eyes on you, that you would give them strong faith, Lord, that in the days where they grow weary or doubt, I pray that they would renew their strength, that they would renew their faith. They would fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of the faith, and they would run this race that is set before them. God, may we as a church family continue to love them and, and pray over them and with them and support them. So Lord, show us how to be your hands and your feet to Francisco, to Kayla, to Ethan. And to baby Wesley, God, we pray that this family would know that you are a good God and you're taking care of them. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for the gift of life. And Lord, you knew exactly what was going to happen before any of us did. So we can trust you through that. May you be blessed and honored through this journey. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, 
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for supporting Francisco and Kayla and Ethan and baby Wesley. It's going to be a great time for us to be the body of Christ. We live within a culture that longs for something true. But what is truth? Where does truth come from? How can we trust if something is true? To know truth is to know God, since He is the creator of truth. There's nothing that can replace God's message of truth, the gospel. It's time that we block out the noise and embrace His truth. Good morning, Five Stone. It's so good to be back with you. And I want to say welcome to those guests who are with us and those who have joined us online. And it's great just to see the body of Christ be the body and bear each other's burdens and weep with those who weep this morning and, and be about advancing the gospel. We've been in this series called Not Another Gospel. If you haven't been with us the first two weeks, this is week number three. And uh, next week we will conclude this series. And so what we've been doing is hitting some highlights in the book of Galatians. So today we will be in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Uh, week 1, basically, we centered back on the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel message, and we see how it's easy to drift away from it, but the good news of Jesus, who he is, that he's king, that he's Lord, the fact that we've sinned against him, that we rebelled against him, but he came, right, died on a cross for our sins, sins of the whole world, was buried in a grave three days later, rose from the dead, and, and, and he ascended back to heaven, and he sat back down at the right hand of God, and that he's alive, and that's our hope, right, that Jesus is, is king of kings, and he's lord of lords, and he's alive, and, and we celebrate that uh, every week. We celebrate that on a daily basis. We share the gospel with ourselves. We share it to those who don't know him. We have a message of hope, and that's what we talked about in, in week one, and last week we talked about uh, you know, what it means to be rooted in the gospel, to have our story rooted in the gospel, because when winds of cultural opinion blow and when people start naming their opinions and, and, and when we live in a culture that opposes the gospel, we have to know where our root system is as what we're dealing with today. And so today we talk about freedom and the gospel. What does it mean to really be free? And here's the truth is that the gospel of Jesus Christ sets us free from bondage. It sets us free from oppression and that's the good news. But in, our, in, in being totally free in the gospel, we are called to contend for the faith of the gospel, as the book of Jude tells us, because well, if we live in a culture that uh, is opposed to the gospel, then there's going to be some things uh, that come against us in, in, in our fight for freedom, right? And in, in our uh, effort to stay central to the gospel, to stay faithful to the gospel. And here in chapter 5, he talks about two main things that oppose us and our freedom in the gospel that will come against us. We have an enemy, Satan, in the kingdom of darkness that hates the gospel. So if he can get the church, if he can get the body of Christ not focused on the gospel, if he can get us to desert the gospel or dilute the gospel, he wins that battle, right? We, he hasn't won the war, but he wins that battle. So there's so many things coming at us in today's culture. So our heart behind this series was to, to look in the book of Galatians, but also have it address some things that we are dealing with inside of the church and outside of the church. And so there's two big things that we deal with in being free with the gospel. And number one is this, it, it, it Paul's talking about how legalism fights against the gospel. And we're going to explain what that means in a moment. And the second thing he talks about, our very own flesh, our sinful nature. So number one is this, and you can write it down. There's two big things that I want to say. And you can also see our notes in version in the Bible app under Five Stone Community Church. But number one is this, it's the gospel versus legalism. In the first seven verses, the gospel versus legalism. So let's read those, the first seven verses of Galatians 5, starting in verse 1. He says this, for freedom, there it is, Christ has set us free. He says, stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. He said, take note, Paul, 
I'm telling you that if you get yourself circumcised, now kids, ask your parents or one of the other pastors what that means, but these false teachers were telling them that they had to be circumcised. They can have Jesus, but they still have to have that, and I'm glad I live in the 21st century, amen? It says, Christ will not benefit you at all. He says, again, I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to do the entire law. He says, you who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. For we eagerly await through the Spirit, by faith, the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. But what matters is, is faith working through love. And that's key right there. You are running well. Who prevented you from being persuaded regarding the truth? So he said, hey, you're free in the gospel for freedom. He says, Christ has set us free. In verse 1, he says, so hey, don't get tangled again in a yoke of bondage. So these false teachers had come in and, and they had told them, hey, you can have Jesus, but you gotta, you got to be circumcised. you got to add all these things to it. So they were putting weights on themselves. They were saying, you have to add, you have to perform. You still got to follow all the Jewish customs. So legalism was infiltrating the church. And I believe today that is the same problem. So legalism sounds like a big word, but what is that? What is that? Legalism is this, is when we put weights on ourselves and others that Jesus doesn't put on us. When we put weights on ourselves and others that Jesus doesn't put on us. There was this one time I decided I wanted to try and get in shape. And so I joined this group workout, and on day one, and it was an outdoor thing. And so on day one, man, I, was, I, was, I thought I was doing good, and I felt like I'd been going for 30 minutes. I felt like I was going to die, and I realized it was only two minutes in. And the person beside me, I was going to look over, maybe I can focus on encouraging the person next to me. And it, there was a lady, she was about 20 years older than me, and she's sitting there, she's getting it, but she has a 20-pound weight vest on. You talk about humbling for me. I'm like, I was thinking, hey, this is hard enough, but you have added 20 or 30 extra pounds of weight, and then you're still doing this. And I thought about that as I thought about the message this week. God kind of dropped this message is that that's what legalism is. We're totally free in the gospel. These people were free in the gospel. God had, had greatly moved in their lives. And what were they free to do? They were, they were free to serve Jesus. They were free for, uh, for, for Christ to, to make an impact through them in their cities. But what happened? These false teachers came in and started adding extra weights to them. Now, you still got to have this. They, they, he says, you were running well in verse 7, but who hindered you? You've gotten away from, from eagerly awaiting, he says, the hope of righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit. You were running so great, and you let these people come in and add extra weights to you that you don't have to carry. And in this race that you're running in the Christian life, you've, you, you've stopped running, and, you, and you've, you've put extra weights on yourself that you don't have to put on. Let me ask you this question this morning. What kind of weight did you carry in here today? We all carry weights, right? Maybe you're running with the weight of somebody else's opinion. You're running with the weight of performance. You're trying to impress people at work. You're trying to impress your family. You're trying to impress God. But instead, you feel this weight on you. You're trying to earn your way. You're trying to, to live life in your own power. Maybe you have the weight of oppression. Maybe you have the weight of depression. I don't know what kind of weight that you're carrying but the good news is this, is that Galatians teaches us that through the power of Jesus Christ and because of the gospel, those weights come off of us and we're free in Jesus. That's what he's saying. He's saying don't get entangled in the yoke of bondage. What is a yoke? It's what they used to, these big long pieces of wood that they would put on ox to keep them going in the right direction. It's just, it's just a weight on their back. I was trying to get a hold of one to bring it today, but I couldn't find one. But it's a weight. It's, it's something we carry around. And Jesus says in, in Matthew 11, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. He says, and I'll give you rest. Because he says, my yoke isn't heavy. My yoke is easy. And my burden is light. What kind of weight did you carry in here this morning? You're online and you're, you're dealing with the weight. And, and when, we're, when we get back to the gospel, those weights come off. 
Legalism is a danger because it's, it's subtle. And I believe that all across the U.S., legalism is strangling the life out of the church. I've grown up in a church and, ha- and had the privilege of, of traveling to a lot of different churches in my ministry. And, and I've, I've walked into some places that were just dead. And thank God Five Stone's not like that. But some places that just had the, the life just drained out of them. And people that, that claim the gospel, they, they claim to know Jesus, but yet there's no joy in the place. It feels like walking into a morgue, right? It's just dead and People are just going through the motions, and people aren't really living it. It's just something that they do. It's just a part of their routine every week, and and there's no excitement. There's no celebration. There's no eagerly awaiting the hope of righteousness. There's, There's no hope there, but they say that they believe in Jesus. What's the problem? And I believe is this. They've let legalism take them over. Yeah, we can have Jesus, but I think people should do church this way. Uh, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but, but people need to measure up to this standard that I have. And, and, and when they don't meet this standard that I have, when they don't measure up, I'm going to put that weight on them. But it becomes not about love. It becomes not about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's legalism. Or, or, or it's when you know the rules, right? When you, when you, when you know the right things to say, but, but yet inwardly, you're, you're just not there. There's, it's a big word that they use. It's called moral therapeutic deism where church makes me strive to be a better person, right? And I, I'm trying to follow the rules and I'm trying to do this, but, but there's no excitement in your heart about the gospel. That's when you become about legalism and not the gospel. It's very easy for all of us to slip into that. When, when, we, when we lose our passion for the gospel, Culturally, there's, there's a popular term, as, as I mentioned last week, that there's people, uh, popular writers, singers, artists, people that once claimed Jesus that have now abandoned the faith, and now they're on TikTok, they're on social media, they're popular, it's a big deal, they're, they're going viral, and they call themselves ex-evangelicals, right? I'm an ex-Jesus follower, I'm an ex-evangelical. And I just started reading some of their stories and some of their quotes and preparing uh, for this message. And I find it sad that the common theme in, in those quotes and in those stories is this, is, is, is I became an ex-evangelical. Why? Because, uh, I, you know, I went to church and I had this experience with this person or I, I felt like there was a weight on me. There was a weight of pressure. There was a weight of performance or I grew up in the Christian home and I had to put on a face when I come to church and so you got to be careful when dealing with church hurt that you're not mad at Jesus, but you're just mad at legalism. It's easy to confuse it sometimes, right? There's no problem with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but there, there, there's a hurt towards legalism. And if you've been hurt by that, we don't take that lightly, right? I'm sad that you're hurt, and I'm praying for your heart. But you know what? The gospel of Jesus Christ is what heals your heart. You got to be careful. Sometimes we get confused. Oh, we're mad at Jesus. We're, we're mad at, no, we're, you're mad at legalism, which is what Jesus preached against. You see how much Jesus rebuked Pharisees. Why? Phariseeism is this. It's the same as legalism. When we make sure the outside looks good, we make sure everything does what? We make sure everything looks good on paper, but inside we can still be full of, in Jesus' words in Matthew 23, dead man's bones. Easily we can be full of just, of just death where It's like putting makeup on a pig, right? It it doesn't really help. We want to take care of the outside, but we stop worrying about the inside. And he's like, hey, you got legalism is an opponent of the gospel. And you got to be careful. He's saying these people are are coming in and you got to be careful. But you say, Garrett, how do I know in my life if I'm about the gospel or if I'm about legalism. How do I know if, how can I tell if, if legalism has infiltrated my heart or not? And he says it in these later verses. So let's look at verse 13 right here. He says this, For you are called to be free, brothers and sisters. He says, Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. 
But if you bite and you devour one another, you see what he's doing? He's contrasting. He's saying these are the matchups, loving people but versus biting and devouring one another. Watch out or you will be consumed by one another. Watch out or you will be consumed by one another. So the evidence of gospel freedom, how do I know if I'm walking in gospel freedom? The evidence of gospel freedom is loving your neighbor. Is you're just a person of love, like you genuinely and you passionately love people. Just love comes out of you. And the love of Jesus doesn't allow people to stay the same, right? The love of Jesus transforms. He says, your freedom that you have is not an opportunity to serve your flesh. It's not a license to go out and live in sin, but it's the freedom to do something you never could have done before in your own power, which is what? Which is love your neighbor, right? Just love people. And he says the opposite of that, the evidence of legalism is biting and devouring your neighbor. When your neighbor doesn't agree with you, when your neighbor doesn't measure up to the standard you have in your mind, instead of loving them, there's what? There's biting and there's devouring. And we see this all across the body of Christ, right? Just, just open up Facebook, not, not now. Just, just go to Twitter or whatever your preferred is or Instagram. What, what is the body of Christ doing, sadly, over, over dumb things? things that aren't going to matter in eternity, and I don't even have to name them because you know what they are. What is it? It's biting and devouring instead of, of, of loving. What, what comes out of your life? It's seen in how you treat each other in the body of Christ. It's seen how you treat those who don't know Jesus. If you claim to know Jesus, but there's no passion in your heart for someone that you know doesn't know Jesus to know Jesus, if you're not sharing the gospel with them and if you're not inviting them to partake, if you're not inviting them to, to, to experience Jesus, if you're not trying to share the gospel with them, then what does that mean? Then legalism has taken over your heart. It's when it, everything becomes about us and not Jesus, about our preferences and not Jesus. Our, our way, not Jesus' way. What's the evidence in your heart? How is your heart today? Is it taken over by legalism or is it taken over by the gospel of Jesus Christ, which causes you to love? I was in IHOP last week with a friend who's in a youth pastor, and, and uh, we had a waitress, and we started getting to know her and talking to her. And before we left, he asked her uh, this question. He says, what is, you and your friends, what, is your, what do you think about Christians? What do you think about people that claim to follow Jesus. And she said this, she goes, well, we don't have anything against Jesus or the gospel, she says, but Christians come across to us as just, they're, they're just marked by just being critical and judgmental. And I was hoping the first word out of her mouth would be, Christians are the most loving people I, we've ever met. No, she goes, they're super judgmental, like in, in a sinful way. What comes out of your life? It's how you, how, if I were to ask the people in your life, in your workplace, in, in your family, your people at home, or however you encounter, where they say, man, that, that's a person uh, of radical love. Just the love of Jesus comes out of them. Or that's a person who's just toxic. I just feel dark. I feel oppressed when I'm around them. Jesus says this, John 13. By this you will know, people will know who are my disciples. If you do what? If you love one another. That's why I love each other. Now, love isn't like, oh, hey, I'm just not going to ever speak the truth to someone. But love is when you, when you speak the truth, but you do it out of love. Not a pharisaical, pharisaical way, but you do it out of like genuine compassion, but you tell the truth. It's the love of Jesus. But the love of Jesus doesn't leave someone where they're at. He doesn't allow people to stay the same. What does the love of Jesus do? It, he transforms it says in 1 Peter 1, he says, he brings us out of darkness into what? Into marvelous light. And if we, when we love people, what happens? We share the gospel with them. The same thing happens in their life that has happened in what? In our life. But here's the next opponent to the gospel. So we see is this. It's the Holy Spirit versus the flesh. It's the Holy Spirit versus the flesh. And when I say flesh is this, is it's your sinful nature that's in rebellion against God that Jesus rescues you out of. And when you repent and when you put your faith in Jesus, he gives you a gift 
who is God to live in your life forever, and that is the Holy Spirit, to empower you and to, to live a life that you never would have been able to live in your own power. And he's going to break that down for us and tell us what that means. So verse 16, he says, I say then, he says, so walk by the Spirit. How do I not get caught up in the legalism that you're talking about before? He says, walk by the Spirit. Live your life by the Holy Spirit. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Let him direct your steps. Your lifestyle is what he says when he uses the word walk. It's your whole life. He says, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So he's saying here, hey, you got to be led by the Spirit, to be empowered by the Spirit, because your flesh, your sinful nature is going to come against you every day of your life. So there's an opposite response, and there's an equal danger. In efforts to get away from legalism, and I've seen this amongst my generation and and people I went to Bible college with and who, who have grown up in really destructive legalistic environments, they, have, they go to the other end of the spectrum. And in order to avoid legalism, what they do is, is they just start living a completely pagan lifestyle. They go to paganism, which means this. They just live a life that reflects the world. They live a life just totally in their flesh that doesn't look like Jesus. So they go from legalism to the opposite end of the spectrum. And what Paul is saying is this, is you got to watch out for the flesh. you got to watch out that you don't go to the other end and you totally aren't living the life that Jesus has called you to live. You're totally avoiding the Holy Spirit. You're neglecting the Holy Spirit and you're living completely in your flesh. So yeah, you claim Jesus, but you have a life that looks like the world is what he's saying. You got a version of Christianity that believes worldly principles. Yeah, we talk about Jesus, but our drive is not the gospel, but it's whatever the message of the world is. That our drive isn't the gospel, but, and our life doesn't look like Jesus, but it's how everybody else is living. He says, you got to be careful that when in you're in trying to avoid legalism that you just don't start living in your own flesh, your old nature. You pick up that old weight that Jesus took off of you and you put it on. And you live in it every day. Sadly, I've seen so many people give their life to Jesus. So they pray. They want Jesus to come in their life. But they don't understand the journey that Jesus has for them on a daily basis. They, they say, yeah, I want to I take the benefits of the cross. But then they walk away and go back to their old selves. When it says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, If anyone is in Christ, they are what? They are a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become what? Become new. He makes you into a new person. He gives you a life. He gives you a purpose through the Holy Spirit. Not to walk back in your flesh, but to walk and be led on a daily basis by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you say, well, how do I know if I'm living a a Holy Spirit-driven life? Or how do I know if I'm being driven by my flesh today? And he's going to give you evidence. There's evidence of a flesh-driven life. And he's going to name lists today. There's a bad list here, and there's a good list. He starts in verse 19. He breaks it down. He says, so this is how you know. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity. Like your, your views of sex and the way that you live doesn't come from the Bible. It says it comes from the world. You're sleeping around outside of marriage, he's saying. You're, you're, you're committing adultery. You're, you're into pornography. You're, 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 you're taking your views from the culture and not from the Bible. This is dangerous. We, we go straight, well, I don't want to be legalist. I don't want to be judgmental. But then we go away from Jesus. We turn our back on Jesus, and we just go straight into the world. He says, that's a problem. But he also said idolatry. We start loving things more than God. Sorcery. Witchcraft. That's, that's practicing things. Especially around this time of year, right? It's a, it's a danger. People are doing this stuff. Sorcery. Hatreds. Man, you just, you just can't stand other people. You just get the spirit of hatred. Strife and jealousy. Outburst of anger. Selfish ambitions. Dissensions, which is division and, and factions. Gossiping about people in the body of Christ. Forming fashion, in, factions. Envy. Wanting something that someone else has, right? Drunkenness. And I've seen this a lot too, right? Well, the Bible 
you know, says it's okay or doesn't say it's not okay to drink, right? So what I'm going to do is in your effort to not be legalist, you've went too far, you've had too much fun, and you found yourself what? In drunkenness. That's a danger too. Well, I I don't want to be like judgmental, so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to exercise my freedom. So you exercise your freedom a little bit too much and you found yourself doing what? Wobbling around, right? In another world, you know what I mean? Drunkenness, carousing, anything similar. He says, I'm warning you about these things, as I've warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He said, That's, this is the evidence of a flesh-filled life. He's saying this. It's not about ch- checking the list to, to see which one you do more than the other. That's legalism, right? Well, 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 this person, I struggle with this, but this person struggle. I'm glad I struggle with this, and this person don't struggle with that. The point is what he's saying is this. Is this coming out of your life? Are you being driven by these things? Do these things consume your life? Then your life is driven by what? Your own flesh. You neglect the Holy Spirit, and you do what? You are driven by your own flesh. That's evidence of a flesh-filled life. But there's also the fruit. How do I know if I'm being driven by the Holy Spirit? There's the fruit of the Holy Spirit-driven life. And watch this. He's going to list this out. But the fruit of the Spirit, he says, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. He's saying, now those who belong to Jesus Christ have done what? This is the good news because you have, we have power over sin through Jesus. Have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. There's areas that we come to that are gray, that people debate, is this right or is this wrong? Can I do this? Am I free to do this or am I free to do that? Here's a question when you come across one of those questions. Here's a question that we all need to ask ourselves is this, is the Holy Spirit glorified in this, right? If we're called to keep in step with the Holy Spirit, is he glorified in this? Is Jesus glorified in this freedom that I want to partake in? That's a question you can ask. If you, are you getting conviction from the Holy Spirit, or is he glorified in that? We've got to be careful not to go to the other end of the spectrum. If my four-year-old son, Graham, he likes to go to Bass Pro Shop and look at the fish. And so if he were to come to me and say, I want to go, and I agree to take him one day. And he's four years old. He's never done this. This is just hypothetical, but he has the ability to. I'm the one that can drive him to that place, right? I'm the one that has the keys. I'm the one that has the money. I'm his dad. I can make things happen. I can make this happen for him. But what if he stole my keys, went into my truck, and locked me out of the truck and said, I'm going to do this by myself? There's a problem there, right? There's a problem because he can't drive. He has no idea what he's doing. He don't have any money to get himself anywhere. He doesn't know where he's going. He's probably going to, if he even has the ability to start the truck, he's probably going to crash it into a tree or someone's house. That's what we do with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the most neglected person in all of Christianity because we're like, hey, God, we got our knowledge. You know, we got our programs. We got, you know, we got churches on every corner. We got podcasts with every preacher in the world that we can listen to, and and we can do this thing. We can make things look good on the outside because we have that ability. We have the money to do that right. But what we do is, is we completely neglect the Holy Spirit. And then we end up crashing, and we say, why? We end up having lives that look not like Jesus, but like the world. We end up having versions of Christianity that, that, that teach worldly principles and not the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is what you'll find in a lot of places. Where it becomes about us and not about Jesus. And, and, we, and we've completely bypassed the Holy Spirit and we've gotten into our own flesh. He's saying this legalism in, in the, your flesh and paganism. He said they're dangerous to the gospel And so the answer is, is is, is not go from left field completely to right field and then all the way back far into left field, but to center your life on the gospel of Jesus Jesus Christ. And the real freedom is this, is that you have, you can live a lie. The Holy Spirit lives this life through you that you couldn't live on your own in your own power. 
that it's not about what I do, it's about what's already been done, right? That it's about what Jesus has already done and what Jesus has already paid for on the cross in the resurrection, right, is the receipt that he paid for it. And all we got to do is surrender. That's good news. We just say, Holy Spirit, here I am. Take me, use me, do with me what you want to do. Live this life. And we're free because why? He's empowering us to live the life that we never could have lived on our own. That's good news. And all the other systems, you got to try to measure up. You got to try to do more, bad, no, more good things than you do bad things. And it just becomes a performance. And here in following Jesus, it's not about performance. It's not about rules. It's not about empty, dead religion, but it's about a life-changing, life-transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. She said, Gary, what if I found myself today, I'm caught up in legalism. I'm, I'm caught up in my flesh. That, man, that list, I'm caught up in a lot of those things on it. What do I need to do? So there's one next step today. What do I need to do? And here's the next step. Take off any weights and sin by practicing repentance and confession. And I got one more, Hebrews 12, one. Let's read that. I'm gonna read that. I forgot to read that, but this is very important. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, he says, let's lay aside every hindrance, or another word is weight, and the sin, that's our flesh, right? So that, easy, that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Why can we do that? It's because of the gospel. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's the good news. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Lay aside every weight and sin. So we're going to have a moment of response time where there'll be some pastors and prayer team up here to pray with you. But the next step is this, take off any weight. You can take it off. It says those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh, right? It's already dead. It's already gone. It doesn't have to have power over you anymore. You give it power over you because you choose to live in that rather than the power of the Holy Spirit. But he says you can take off any weight, take off sin, lay it aside. By doing what? Practicing confession and repentance. You might say, well, we often think, well, if I confess sin, then that's going to lead to guilt and shame. I don't want anybody to know that. I don't want to get that out. 1 John 1, 9, let me remind you of that this morning. It says this, that if you confess your sins, it says he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Here's the deal. He already knows anyway. You just lay it aside. You confess it and you repent. You turn your back on it. And what happens? You say, Holy Spirit, take this. I'll take you, I surrender to you, I, I yield to you. And what happens? You get empowerment, you get freedom, you have clarity on what he's called you to do, you have clarity on your purpose. And you're, as Eugene Peterson says, you're the freest, Christ followers are the freest people in the world. Because we've left the bondage of sin, a bad master. We left Satan and we surrendered to a better master who is what? His name is Jesus. And now we're the freest people in the world. Are you free today? Take that weight off. Maybe you're here and you, you haven't given your life to Jesus. And that's the biggest weight that needs to lift is, is, is being separated from God. And through repentance and through faith, put your faith in Jesus, that weight can come off this morning. And you can be free. If you're online, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. If you're here, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to go into a response, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the gospel. God, I pray that every man and woman, boy and girl, young man and woman that is listening online or that is here with us today, Lord, I pray that those that are carrying just weights, maybe of other people's opinions, of, of things people put on them or things they put on themselves or the weight of sin, God, I pray that through the power of Jesus Christ, you would lift that right now, that people would experience freedom in Jesus. Those that are online, I pray the same for them, that you would just move today, that you would speak today. Jesus, I pray you'd have your way today. I pray that, that people that have been sitting in bondage for a long time, that they didn't bondage that they did not have to live in, Lord, I pray that they would say, you know what? The greatest gift that's been given to me is the Holy Spirit. And that I can surrender to the Holy Spirit. I can yield. Holy Spirit, I pray you would bring conviction. Lord, I pray that you would bring freedom, that you bring repentance. Jesus, we thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've done. 
And may you move, may you speak, may we experience the freedom that's in you today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you stand to your feet, we're going to worship the prayer team and team of pastors are going to be up here. If you need prayer, you need someone, uh, whatever it is, you need someone to talk to or you just want to get by yourself, it's open, you can come. If you're online and you need someone to pray for you, I gave my life to Jesus, whatever it is, email us, info at fivestonechurch.com and we'll, someone will reach out to you this week. As God, move, as God moves in your heart, you respond this morning. through
Amen. It's been a great day of worship today. Man, let me encourage you. We have our Operation Christmas Child boxes out in the, in the foyer. Man, we are starting that up this week. You can take a box, pack it for a, a child across the world who needs to know the hope and love of Jesus Christ. And you can bring that back uh, starting in November. We'll begin receiving those boxes back as you... Uh, Bring those back to us. But you can take one today or they'll be out there the next several days, several weeks as we uh, continue this campaign. Hope you'll be a part of it with us as we uh, celebrate. Man, thank you for being here this morning. You have a great week. You are dismissed. See you next week.